sale U.S. hiring of sex perverts. Uh, and the newspapers covered bar raids. Uh, these are all examples, uh, 87 arrested uh, in a vice net, which what they mean by that was a gay bar raid. Um, 58 people, 40 people in a raid at the Rush Street Inn. Um, people under these circumstances lived in the closet. Um, the phrase that was used in the 50s was wearing a mask that people pretended in their lives to families, friends, co-workers, that they were heterosexual or gender conforming. And occasionally someone does become visible, but it's usually against their will and as an attack upon them. For instance, Bayard Rustin was an important civil rights activist, the organizer of the 1963 March on Washington. And a couple of weeks before the march, the FBI provided information to a senator from South Carolina, uh, Strom Thurmond, who revealed on the floor of the Senate that the organizer of this march was a sex pervert. In other words, he was gay. Um, Rustin survived and uh, the civil rights movement backed him, but it's a good example of the vulnerability. Now, in the 50s and 60s, there are no TV series about LG, with LGBT characters. The most visible cultural representation of LGBT life in these years were what were called lesbian pulp novels. They were widely available. They sold in drugstores and newsstands everywhere. Uh, and they were scandalous and negative in their portrayal. Uh, the covers are offensive, but I'll show you a couple to give you a sense of the times, uh, warped twisted passions in the twilight world or degraded women. So how do LGBTQ people resist this uh, when the oppression is that intense? Well, a continuous history of LGBTQ activism finally starts around 1950. Three organizations, John, I'm sorry to interrupt you. If, um, we cannot see your slides yet. I didn't know if that was on purpose or- Are you serious? Oh my yeah. God. Okay, I don't know what that's about. Uh, okay, I'll, um, okay I'll, I'll try one more time. Uh, uh, is it showing, is anything showing now? Not yet. Okay, well, uh, let's- Okay, I'm gonna do share screen one more time. Okay, okay. now we have it. Okay, uh, and uh, unfortunately I will start from, uh, from where I am rather than go back to the original ones. Uh, the, uh, so this where I, I was talking about the beginning of uh, LGBTQ organized activism. The three main organizations in the 1950s were the Mattachine Society, uh, One Incorporated, and Daughters of Belitis. Um, all of them uh, were started in California. Uh, they hold meetings, they have public lectures in which they invite ministers, lawyers, psychologists uh, to speak. Uh, they publish magazines. The Mattachine and the Daughters also have chapters in a few cities, including uh, Chicago. Um, but given the times, it was a very cautious kind of activism. Uh, the names of the organizations, for instance, no one would ever know that these were LGBTQ organizations. By, based on the name. Many of the members of the organizations use pseudonyms when they write an article or uh, lead a meeting so as not to expose themselves. Uh, so they try to be reasonable and responsible in this decade of oppression. Um, but yet at the same time, admittedly, they are also life-saving organizations for the relatively small number of people around the country who learn about them and subscribe to their magazines. Also during the 50s and early 60s, there's a small number of individuals who do push the envelope. Um, 
Christine Jorgensen, for instance, is the first American to have uh, what today we might would call gender affirmation surgery, but at that point was uh, described as sex change surgery. And she remained public throughout the 50s and 60s about her real self uh, and spoke about trans issues. Uh, Valerie Taylor was a Chicago-based novelist who took advantage of the uh, pulp uh, genre, but used them to write uh, positive novels about lesbian life, like Whisper Their Love or A World Without Men. Jose Saria was a, a drag performer in San Francisco's uh, gay bars. And in 1961, in response to a wave of police raids and arrests in bars, he actually runs for city supervisor in San Francisco. He didn't win, but he's the first openly LGBTQ person to run for public office. Now, by the mid 1960s, uh, some homophile activists and groups are becoming more visible and assertive. And it's clearly the impact of the civil rights movement, which is making collective protest and demands for equality more commonplace. Um, in particular, uh, there was a man in Washington DC named Frank Kameny. Um, he uh, was an astronomer who was working for the federal government in the 50s, but who was fired from his job because uh, they discovered he was gay and he never was able to get employment in his field again. Uh, he forms a chapter of the Mattachine Society in the early 1960s uh, and plays a key role in pushing the federal government to drop its ban on hiring uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people. The government didn't even talk about transgender people in this period of time. Uh, Kameny also with other activists organized the first demonstrations, public demonstrations of LGBTQ activists. And I'll show you a couple of pit photographs of them. Um, notice how orderly and respectable these demonstrations are. Uh, they're not, they're out there, but they're not trying to cause trouble. Uh, another way that the 60s affects things is that the movement adopts the slogan, gay is good, in the summer of 1968. Well, by the time we get to the second half of the 1960s, the upheavals in America are reaching further into the LGBT community. Uh, Philadelphia, San Francisco, Los Angeles, all saw rowdy and disruptive public demonstrations in response to police harassment of bars and the exclusion of LGBT people from local restaurants for improper behavior or wearing non-traditional clothing. Trans women were often the individuals who were in the lead of those demonstrations. Uh, building on what militant African-Americans were doing and saying, Chicago activists begin using the phrase gay power in the late 1960s. And with such things starting to happen in June of 1969, when the police in New York raid a Greenwich Village bar called the Stonewall Inn, the patrons of the bar fight back and several nights of rioting ensue. And Stonewall becomes the symbolic marker of a major historical turning point, the birth of what was described then as a gay liberation movement. By the following year, there is enough new militant angry activism by this younger generation that activists in New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago all have a march and rally to commemorate the Stonewall Rebellion. And now, of course, pride parades and marches are held all around the globe in June every year. And uh, these are some images of demonstrations in the early 1970s. Notice how different they look from the earlier ones that I showed you. Uh, people shouting on the street, uh, angry posters that they're carrying with them, lesbian revolution, uh, 
all power to the people. Um, now, a key element of this new liberation movement was the call to come out, uh, to come out of the closet, uh, reject shame, reject secrecy, reject pretending and declare yourself, become visible to everyone. So uh, with this new kind of militant activism, what changes? in the 1970s. Well, first of all, there's an explosion of organizations. Uh, at the time of Stonewall, there were maybe 50 LGBTQ organizations in the US. By 1974, there are close to a thousand. Some come and go quickly, some last, but they bring people together uh, for community activism and collective identity. And they have a wide range of missions. Uh, you have local all-purpose activist organizations. Um, you have religious organizations like Dignity for Gay Catholics, uh, uh, synagogues for LGBT Jews. Um, there are cultural organizations like gay and lesbian choruses, music festivals, uh, theater troops. Uh, health and social service organizations like the Howard Brown Medical Center, in sh which still exists in Chicago today and was started in 1973, and some national organizations like the National Gay Task Force or Lambda Legal. A second development is what we would call, I would call cultural representation. Um, the movement in the community is no longer dependent on uh, what a paper like the Tribune is willing to say. Um, and so a queer press and queer publishing gets established. Um, the covers and titles are right out there. I mean, look at this, Lesbian Tide. Uh, a publication in Boston was called Fag Rag. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, a lesbian press publishes a novel called Ruby Fruit Jungle, which became a bestseller um, and was nothing like the lesbian pulp novels. Another characteristic of change in the 70s is that the community and the movement win allies. Organizations like the American Civil Liberties Union, the American Bar Association, the National Council of Churches, the American Psychological Association, all take positive public stances around this new gay liberation movement, calling for decriminalization, non-discrimination, and the like. Uh, and it's important, I should mention, that in the 70s, the gains that are made, and I, I will talk about these the gains in a minute, are all occurring around sexual orientation. Gender identity isn't yet asserting itself uh, with the same level that, for instance, we see today. So there are victories in the 70s. The American Psychiatric Association in 1973 removes homosexuality from its list of mental illnesses. Uh, the federal civil service ban is loosened in 1975. Some states repeal their sodomy laws. Uh, a few cities and towns pass laws against sexual orientation discrimination. The first people run for office as out of the closet members of the community and get elected. Um, and some other gains like that. And importantly, I'll mention, there is the beginning of a decline in police harassment, which is very, very important. But what doesn't change in the 1970s? Well, in comparison to how things were before, the changes that I've described are significant, but they're also limited. Uh, for instance, the overwhelming majority of LGBTQ people have not come out and most are not in any way political activists or community activists. It's also a very internally divided population uh, based on uh, gender uh, and race uh, and, and identities of different kinds. So in Chicago, you have Chicago gay liberation, but you also have Chicago lesbian liberation. You have third world gay revolution for people of color and the transvestite legal committee. Um, and 
this, these differences based on race and gender and identity are reflected in community institutions. Uh, for instance, in the 70s and early 80s, racial discrimination in gay and lesbian bars is very common in Chicago and in other cities as well. But the, the major thing to point out about the 70s is that just as the 60s give birth to LGBTQ radicalism and militants, uh, a politicized Christian evangelical movement rises up in the 1970s and becomes the focus and the driving force of intense homophobia. And the, the first high profile public targeting of the movement comes in Dade County, Miami, Florida in 1977, which had passed a sexual orientation non-discrimination bill. And in response, uh, someone named Anita Bryant, uh, a beauty pageant winner, uh, a popular singer, uh, a spokesperson for the Florida citrus industry, organizes a a repeal campaign of the law through a voter referendum. Um, and the voters in Miami overwhelmingly repeal the anti-discrimination law. And Brian begins to travel around the country at that point uh, and uh, to lead other repeal campaigns in a number of other cities. Um, and the biggest of these campaigns occurred in Florida um, where in, in California, excuse me, where there was a statewide ballot initiative, Proposition 6, that would require the firing of any school employee known to be LGBT or any school employee who spoke favorably about sexual orientation. Now, fortunately, Proposition 6 was defeated. Uh, and uh, it led to probably the biggest mobilization of the gay community that had occurred up until that point. Briggs is the name of this, of the state legislator who had sponsored Proposition 6. And Anita Bryant also, uh, by giving such vocal visibility to homophobia, has the effect of bringing more people out of the closet. Uh, pride marches in 1977 were noticeably bigger than they had been earlier. Um, Bryant comes to Chicago in 1977, uh, and it provokes the largest LGBTQ demonstration that Chicago had yet seen. So by the end of the 70s, we're seeing the beginnings of the society we live in now, visibility, community, political activism, some victories, but we're still in the very early stages of change. But, and as the 80s begin, because of the rise of this right-wing opposition, things weren't looking very good. And when Reagan is elected in 1970, he gives the evangelical right a voice in national politics. And so just as this wave of a conservative attacks was a taking off, something new enters the scene, the AIDS epidemic. Uh, and as we'll see, uh, and as I'll describe it, AIDS changes everything. AIDS was new, scary, and uncontrollable. The first cases are reported in June and July of 1981. Groups of young men in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York were developing a rare kind of cancer and pneumonia. Their immune systems had collapsed. The common factor that doctors seemed to notice was that they were all gay men. And so initially AIDS was called GRID, gay related immune deficiency syndrome. Um, the number of deaths explodes. Um, there are 166 deaths in 1981. By 1992, the number of deaths were above 194,000. And in these years, most people who were diagnosed with AIDS died within a year. Uh, it gets very little press coverage initially. And then in 1985, Rock Hudson, 
uh, a Hollywood icon from the 50s and 60s is revealed to have AIDS and it becomes a, a front page story. Uh, Hudson dies, uh, and but the publicity actually creates panic. Uh, there are proposals to quarantine people with AIDS, uh, that anyone with AIDS should be compulsorily tattooed. Uh, people are evicted from housing. Uh, they're denied care by hospitals. Uh, Congress passes uh, something called the Helms Amendment, which prohibits federal funding to promote homosexuality, which means how do you educate the gay community about how to prevent AIDS? Uh, President Reagan did not mention AIDS for the first five years of the epidemic. But AIDS mobilizes the LGBT community like never before. And the first uh, kind of response is what we might call local self-help. Uh, they form local health organizations like the Gay Men's Health Crisis or AIDS Project Los Angeles. Uh, lesbians become, and gay men and lesbians were quite separated in the 1970s over issues of sexism. Uh, lesbians get very involved in uh, the fight against AIDS. Uh, and it's a huge step towards bringing the two groups back together again. Uh, there's also local political organizing at city and county level, pushing for money, for service delivery, for public health agencies to be responsive. Uh, and when HIV is finally identified in 1984, the community engages in massive education efforts about risk reduction, about what are called what's called was called safer sex and the use of condoms. Now, just as all of this is happening, all the, the terrible number of deaths and the community trying to save itself and fight back, in 1986, uh, the Supreme Court delivers a decision in Bowers versus Hardwick, Hardwick, which says that state sodomy laws that criminalize gay sex are constitutional. The language is horrible. Uh, that they use. They say no such thing as a fundamental right to commit homosexual sodomy. Uh, they call the legal challenge facetious, uh, that it would overthrow thousands of years of moral teaching. Well, the decision, as you can imagine, was enraging. And if you combine Hardwick with AIDS, the impact on activism is very impressive. Uh, and one dramatic piece of evidence about the scope of change. In 1979, there was a, move, a march on Washington for gay and lesbian rights. Uh, the first national march, it got about 100,000 people. In 1987, in the AIDS epidemic and after Hardwick, there's another march on Washington and it gathers more than half a million people. So by the second half of the 1980s, AIDS is going way beyond generating local responses. It's mobilizing the population as never before. And a key movement comes in 1986 and 1987 when the beginning of direct action groups when they form in a number of cities, including Chicago. And lots of activists deserve credit for this shift, but I wanna mention one in particular, Larry Kramer. Um, he was a novelist who had written a very popular, actually positive novel called Faggots in the 1970s. Uh, in 1983, he wrote an article called 1112 and Counting, uh, meaning that was the number of deaths and said, if we don't get angry and fight back, we will all die. He wrote a very popular play about the AIDS epidemic that was produced around the country called The Normal Heart. Um, in early 1987, he gives a speech at the New York LGBT Community Center and out of it comes the direct action group, ACT UP. And pretty soon, ACT UP 
chapters are forming in cities all around the United States, large cities like Chicago, but also cities like Shreveport, Louisiana. And they engage in powerful demonstrations. They disrupt the New York Stock Exchange. They hold a die-in in, in Daly Plaza in Chicago. They block the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco uh, during rush hour invade the Food and Drug Administration in Maryland and uh, disrupt mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. Uh, and they get lots of media coverage. And again, let me show you images of the demonstration, uh, demonstrations to give you a sense of the, the emotionality and the mood. Um, there's silence equal death, t-shirt, uh, here are, marchers with the posters. Uh, I mean, you can see the anger on people's face. This was uh, a demonstration against Cardinal Bernadine in, uh, in Chicago. Uh, also, the posters that are created are angry posters that hold nothing back. Uh, silence equals death with the pink triangle. Know your scumbags attacking uh, the uh, Catholic clergy. Uh, Reagan, he kills me. For many Blacks and Latinos unable to afford AIDS care, the cost of living is too high. Or one AIDS death every five hours. Uh, and one of the key people doing this is a Chicago-based uh, cartoonist named Danny Sotomayor. This is him in the center. Uh, and he wrote a series of angry cartoons, Drew, that were published in gay publications all around the country. Um, yeah, you know, six million dead from AIDS? Oh, Hitler. Oh, sounds like a good number to me. Uh, you know, just to kind of demonstrate the way nothing is being done by U.S. leaders. Um, one of the other uh, things uh, that happens uh, is the creation of something called the Names Project Quilt. Uh, it uh, really uh, starts in San Francisco in 1987 and travels around the country. Uh, there was a big exhibition of it on Navy Pier in 1988, and it has the effect of making the price of AIDS and lives lost very powerful. Uh, some of the quilt panels that were made, you'll see, personalize um, the individual. So here, uh, a Mexican flag, uh, an alumnus of Columbia and Stanford, a cellist someone who was a daddy and had children. Uh, this was done for Joseph Tucci by uh, his neighbor who was a lesbian, but they didn't know that about each other. And this is the panel for one of the earliest AIDS activists. Now, by the early 1990s, this is starting to make a difference. Uh, the LGBT community becomes part of a national coalition uh, that includes nurses, doctors, social workers, trying to get funding for research and treatment and education. Um, they work at the state and local level, but they also have some national victories. Um, in 1990, the Ryan White Care Act is passed, which is a funding mechanism for AIDS organizations. The Americans with Disabilities Act, when it was passed in 1990, it included HIV as a form of disability. And in 1992, when Bill Clinton ran for president, he became the first major candidate to actively seek out the support of the LGBT community. So I said before that AIDS changes everything. Let me give you some more examples. Lots of people come out. Uh, far more than in the 1970s. And the number of people who come out grow exponentially. Uh, and they're coming out in big cities and small towns. And the 1987 March on Washington was a major catalyst for this. Um, also, most LGBT organizations had been entirely volunteer run. Uh, by the late 80s, more and more of them had paid staff. Uh, 
Uh, groups like Howard Brown, for instance, grow very quickly. Uh, and many of the national organizations like the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force or the Human Rights Campaign grow enormously between the early 80s and the early 90s. The movement also finally begins to develop alliances with uh, significant sectors of, of, quote, the mainstream community, with public health officials, with human resource personnel and corporations, with boards of education that run school systems. And initially, these alliances are about AIDS, but it opens the door to talking about sexual orientation issues more generally. And it's no accident that in 1986, New York, and in 1988, Chicago, finally passed non-discrimination laws based on sexual orientation. And other states and cities are doing it also. And then there's a much greater involvement in traditional electoral politics. You need to lobby around AIDS issues. And so the movement develops ties to congressional and legislative staff, and there are more out of the closet candidates running for office. And the change doesn't stop with just this. Um, some of the other things, there's a much greater visibility and organizing among people of color. Uh, the organization YEGO, uh, the Latino, Lesbian, and Gay Organization, the National Black, Lesbian, and Gay Leadership Forum, the Minority AIDS Project in Los Angeles becomes a model around the country. Uh, in Chicago, uh, there's a gay contingent in the Southside Bud Billiken Parade for the first time in 1993. And uh, lesbian Latinas form Amigas Latinas in 1995. Um, and in many cases, these organizations are able to use AIDS funding available through the Ryan White Care Act to hire staff for AIDS prevention education. But then this also spills into general organizing among the LGBT population within their community. Another change is that the epidemic increases tremendously the visibility and organizing among bisexual and transgender individuals. Um, bisexuals were especially targeted because of AIDS. The media presents them as being responsible for spreading this gay disease into the heterosexual population. Uh, Bisexual organizing really takes off in the 1980s. Uh, the first national conference is held in 1990 where they uh, activists form an organization called BINET. Uh, and the 1993 March on Washington is named a march for lesbian, gay, and bisexual rights. Um, AIDS also helps to expose the marginalization and the needs of the trans population, especially trans women. Different factors put them at risk. Uh, a different kind of outreach and education is necessary, but it didn't happen to any significant degree. So it leads to transgender individuals doing a lot more organizing. Uh, and by the mid 1990s, as the gay and lesbian movement grows and has successes, uh, it starts to become obvious that sexual orientation as a category does not encompass gender identity. Um, there's a series of books in the 1990s by lesbian, uh, by trans authors like Leslie Feinberg, Kate Bordenstein, Pat Califia, and it's in the 1990s. Uh, that LGBT starts being used in many settings for the first time. And then uh, the final thing that I'll say, well, not the final thing, but another important thing is the increase in cultural visibility that AIDS creates. Uh, for instance, in 1993-94, there's a Hollywood film with star Tom Hanks named Phil called Philadelphia that's about AIDS. Uh, the most successful play on Broadway, New York, in the theater that year was Angels in America by Tony Kushner, which is about AIDS. Uh, 
Uh, MTV was one of the first cable stations to have a reality show called The Real World. It includes a character, a, a figure named Pedro Zamora, uh, who is an activist. And then most importantly of all, 1996-97, uh, the TV series Ellen, starring Ellen DeGeneres, the whole season involves a slow process of her coming out. Uh, and I wanna mention Zamora again, because um, he was an AIDS activist and he's the first out gay man on reality television in 1994. And it, it just breaks barriers that then continue to get broken as time goes on. Finally, uh, the last thing that I wanna mention that happens because of the AIDS epidemic uh, is a much greater involvement in national politics. Instead of LGBT being primarily fought at the local and state level, it now becomes part of national political debate. So in 1993, there's a gaze in the military debate uh, that leads to the policy of don't ask, don't tell. But for six months, it's a news story in papers and on television. In 1996, uh, the marriage issue had gotten started uh, after a Hawaii case legalized gay marriage in 1993. In 1996, it's debated in Congress and the Congress passes a Defense of Marriage Act, which prohibits the use of federal benefits for same gender marriages. In 1996 and 2004, which are presidential ye election years, uh, the uh, right wing uses it to have ballot initiatives in dozens of states that explicitly prohibit uh, same sex marriage. And one of the things to say about these three first three items is that, um, you know, national politics isn't necessarily meaning victory because these were all defeats for the movement. But in 19, in 2003, there is an enormous political victory uh, when the Supreme Court rules in Lawrence versus Hardwick that sodomy laws are unconstitutional. And for the first time in US history, love, sexuality between members of the same gender is no longer a crime. And so criminality is no longer the starting point. Now, a lot more could be said about the last 15 years um, since 2003 in Hardwick. Marriage equality was fought nationwide and state after state and finally achieved a few years ago. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of uh, youth organizing uh, in the 2000s with thousands of gay straight or queer straight alliances forming in high schools and middle schools around the country. And um, in the last 15 years, uh, there has been a level of visibility around gender identity and transgender individuals organizing for change like we've never seen before. Um, so there's a lot more obviously that I could have talked about. Uh, I, I wanna mention two final things. Um, first, uh, for those of you who would be interested in learning more LGBTQ history, uh, in Chicago, we have an organization called the Gerber Hart Library and Archives, which has wonderful historical collections and a circulating library. And you can find it at uh, gerberhart.org on the website. The website also includes a lot of history. Uh, and with just a little bit of self-promotion, I, I will mention that uh, last year I published a book called Queer Legacies. Um, and it consists entirely of short chapters, each of which is a different story about Chicago's LGBTQ history. Uh, so um, I will uh, kind of, I will stop there. Um, thank you. And I will, I guess, stop the share. Thank you so much, John. You covered a lot in a very short amount of time. Um, 
If anybody has any questions, please um, put them in the Q&A down at the bottom of your screen. We'll wait just a minute to see if any questions come through um, and then we'll end our program. One, one thing I will mention is that, um, you know, I, I did this talk in about 40 minutes, but ordinarily uh, I would spend in my college teaching a whole semester would cover this material, that there's, uh, there are enough stories to be had and uh, enough books that can be read that you really can fill an undergraduate course with this history. But go ahead. So interesting. We did not get any questions um i think you you i see there are some things in the chat is it possible that people put it there you know that was just somebody letting me know that the live stream wasn't working uh, at the okay. beginning of the uh, okay. program but thanks again thanks again john for being here tonight and thank you everybody for joining us um have a great night thank you it was a pleasure to do this likewise